Hello everyone, my name is Alessandro Ruggera and I'm the director of the Italian Cultural Institute, Istituto Italiano di Cultura. It's a great pleasure to have you here for this uh, first webinar that we have with Serena Spinelli. It's the first lecture that we have. The title is From Raphael's Youth to Modigliani's Strive, Four Works in the Historical Brera Gallery. The idea to organize this uh, webinar came to us um, after we had, as you know, unfortunately, to shut down all the activities here in presence at the Instituto due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I have to say, I mean, I will not repeat what has been said so many, many times, I and mean, that it has been very hard for us as well here at the Instituto. Luckily, we didn't have any major problem here, but to, for an institution like, like us, that we've been used to, to host you and to have you here very often for language classes and different initiatives and, exhibitions, uh, lectures, uh, including the lectures of Serena Spinelli that has been here several times um, and is now connected with us from, uh, from her home in Milan. So hi, hi Serena. Hi Alessandro. <laughs> I was saying it's, it's really, it was really, it's really difficult to cope uh, with this uh, new situation and to have to deal with the fact that uh, we are all apart, we are all uh, the, at the distance and um, and it's important to keep the distance and to and to do so in order to avoid uh, the possibility for the virus to spread um, even more nevertheless we decided to have some of some initiatives and, um, and and to continue with our activities and we have our language classes continuing online and uh, and we are trying to offer you some content part, part of the content uh, online, which is um, a way, I mean, a different uh, approach. And uh, I must say, I, I strongly believe in, in the fact that uh, culture is something we have to enjoy uh, in presence, usually. But we cannot work, we, we cannot be, I mean, without you and without, uh, without our audience and without the possibility to communicate what, what is so dear to us. So our beloved um, Italian culture and the idea that we can put it in dialogue with, uh, with Canadians uh, and with different uh, cultures. So this is the first lecture with Serena Spinelli. I'm very, very happy. You probably all know already Serena Spinelli from the lecture that she, that she held here. Serena is, was born in Rome and then was educated in France, in Ireland, in Belgium and in Canada and in the UK. And she had, she had a Bachelor of Arts uh, with high honors uh, from Carleton University in Ottawa, so a very strong connection with, uh, with Canada. She's currently based in Milan, uh, and where she's speaking from. And, um, and she's working in Milan um, in the education field, uh, organizing activities and guided tours for all the, the most prominent um, Milanese museums uh, included Brera, which is the subject of our lect of the lecture of today. Brera is, uh, by the way, the director of Brera is is a Canadian uh, currently. Yes. <laughs> which is Bradburn is uh, is um, he was at Pitti for a while and now he is at uh, at Brera. Um, so again, an Italian Canadian connection. But <clears throat> um, Brera is probably the most uh, renewed uh, gallery and art gallery in uh, in Milan. Or, Historical Museum in, in uh, Milan. This will be, let's say, this will be a way to invite you to go to Milan and see the museums in person and be again able, I hope, soon, uh, probably next year, to walk through the, to have a, a walk and a stroll through the different uh, rooms of the museums that are so enchanting. And now, somehow, we can have a, a glimpse and a sort of sneak into the museum to have some, to catch some of the secrets. So I'm sure you will enjoy. I just, I just want you to, to remember that this is the first of uh, three lectures. The next will be on June 19, and it will be dedicated to the Ambrosiana collection. And then we'll have another one on June 26 at 3 p.m. again. And that will be the, the private collection of Gian Giacomo Paul di Pezzoli Museum, another perhaps less known museum in, uh, in Milan. So please, Serena, the floor is yours and uh, I'm sure we will enjoy. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro, for that uh, lovely introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me. It's always a, a pleasure to collaborate with the Italian Cultural Institute in Toronto. So the first lecture, as Alessandro was saying, or rather the first narration is going to be about Brera. And I have chosen four different works um, to discuss with you today. And what you see on your screen now is the entrance courtyard of this beloved Milanese institution. And in the photograph, it definitely appears to be enchanted and silent, as if a cruel spell had been cast upon it. Yet the spirit of Brera still speaks very loudly of its complex history. Now the word Brera, you may be wondering where this comes from. The word Brera comes from a Longobard word, an antique Longobard word, uh, Braida, which basically meant uh, uncultivated land. And in fact, when everything began here in the year 1200, this area was a piece of wild uncultivated land. But in the year 1200, everything began when a medieval religious order called the Umiliati built a convent and a church on this very same spot. And their activities continued undisturbed until about the end of the 16th century, when the order was suppressed by the great reformer, Charles Borromeo, who was also happened to be the Archbishop of Milan at the time. Now he assigned the area to the powerful Jesuit order and they turned it into a place of knowledge in the solemn classical style. Now the University of Theology, which the Jesuits uh, founded here, was in its turn shut down by the Austrians in 1770 when their empire annexed northern Italy. And in the spirit of rational enlightenment, uh, the Empress Maria Teresa transformed Brera into a place of culture, into an important cultural center, complete with astronomical uh, observatory, library, and academy of the arts, all of which still exist today, still operate today. Now, the courtyard that you see on your screen was designed by the court architect, Pier Marini, in the very same neoclassical style, which he will use to conjugate the geometry, the very solemn geometry of the royal palace and also of the world famous Scala Opera House. Now, at the center of this magical courtyard, as you can see, there is a sculpted personification of Napoleon as Mars the peacemaker and he stands aloof and proud just as Canova had imagined him. Now indeed the great Brera gallery or Pinacoteca di Brera as we know it today was founded by this political giant and upon conquering northern Italy and following in the footsteps of Maria Teresa he continued the debatable uh, religious suppressions, requisitioning works of art from convents and churches to house them all together under one elegant roof. And the gallery was Napoleon's creature. He had dreamt of creating a second Louvre here in the Italian kingdom. And the official ribbons, let's say, the inauguration, actually occurred in the year 1809. And since then, many generations of travelers, of art lovers, of students, have walked its marble halls, gazed at the old master paintings of a bygone era. Now, my next affirmation might not be so popular, but I like to imagine, in fact, that when our time stopped, and Brera's halls were suddenly devoid of human presence, that was in fact a fruitful day for the appreciation of art. 
I imagine that even though the lights were low and all systems appeared to be down, these Renaissance Madonnas and the Baroque Dukes, the Baroque noblemen, still related to each other in subtle ways, still told stories from one gilded frame to another, still whispered their colorful secrets from one crystal case to another. And this silent dialogue really does exist and it's precious, but it can only be heard when all the background news noise is muted. When our minds do not fret from one social activity to the other. And of course, we now wait with bated breath for the spell to be broken entirely and for all the artistic treasures of the world and all of the treasure chests of all the museums to be opened again, for all the blockbuster exhibitions to begin again. But I feel that absence, absence in this case has made the mind more appreciative. After all, we need only look at a work of art once. It needs only to appear before us once for it to plant its seeds within our consciousness and to enrich our humanity. And it continues to do so through the ages, even when the paintings appear to be in waiting behind the stage curtain of life. So I propose we conjure four works from the memory of Brera, from the spirit of Brera, and allow this enchantment to continue just for a little while longer. So the first work that I'd like to talk about is the one on the left-hand side of your screen, and this is The Marriage of the Virgin by the young Raffaello Sanzio. So it was painted in 1504, and uh, this is an important year, in fact, this year, because it's the 500th anniversary of Raphael's death. But his spirit lives on every time someone enters this room in Brera and every time someone gazes at this work or remembers this work from afar. So Raffaello was only 19 years, of old, 19 years of age when he painted this piece and he will later be known as the Prince of the Renaissance for this idealistic classicism which he will craft and for his important role, for the role that he will have within the Vatican later on. Now our hero was born in the remote village, the remote town of Urbino, and it's now in the region of Le Marche. You can see a perspective, a view of the imposing castle of Urbino in the background of this slide. Now Urbino in the 15th century, the court of, of Urbino was one of the most civilized places in Europe. And this was thanks largely to the interests of the enlightened Duke of Urbino, Federico da Montefeltro. Now the Duke was the Pope's favorite mercenary, so he was a soldier, but he was also a very learned man. His beautifully decorated studiolo or private study was known all over the world. And certainly the arts and refinement of the court of Urbino could easily rival those of Florence, Milan, Mantova, and Ferrara. Now we can see the tortured profile of the Duke of Urbino on the right hand side there. And in fact, he is portrayed in the famous Madonna of the Egg, the Montefeltro altarpiece by Piero della Francesca, which significantly happens to be in the same room where the Raphael is kept in Brera. And this physical closeness between these two masterpieces is not a, co a coincidence, of course, because Piero della Francesca's work represents the kind of culture that Raphael, as a child, was exposed to. So Raphael's father, his name was Giovanni Santi, was also a painter and a poet at the court of Urbino. So Raphael had the extreme fortune of being brought up in this extraordinary 
uh, atmosphere of literary and philosophical and artistic elegance. Now, as Vasari tells us in the lives of the painters, the lives of the artist, when Raphael's father dies, he was sent to the nearby town of Perugia to be apprenticed to the painter Perugino, who was a very famous painter at the time. So in the sweet and elegant manner of the Umbrian polyptics of Perugino. And Raphael certainly rapidly absorbed the teachings of Perugino. And by the time he was 15 years old, he was the most outstanding member of the workshop. Now, the Marriage of the Virgin, which is the piece I'd like to talk about, and it's on the left-hand side there, is a turning point for the young genius of Raphael. It will be the first painting which he proudly signs and dates as an independent master. So the piece was commissioned for the Albizzini Chapel in the Church of San Francesco, located in the beautiful town of Città di Castello. And in the background now, you can see the gorgeous hilly view of this city, which is the original and natural habitat, therefore, of this painting. I'm sure you can notice the sort of hazy blue sky of a late warm afternoon and the golden tan of the, on, of the sun on the stones of the city. And you can notice, I think, the similarity in mood between painting and reality. Now, the subject of this piece comes from an apocryphal text called the Golden Legend. An apocryphal meaning, therefore, that this story uh, had been refuted by the church for lack of historical proof. And the history of Christianity, mind you, is full of these popular anecdotes that circulated by word of mouth, but that had never really been proven. Now, the text in question, the Golden Legend, was written down finally and published in the 13th century by a Dominican friar in Genova called Jacopo da Barazze. And he meant it to be a biography of the saints, but the book was widely read at the time for its very, very interesting stories and anecdotes. Today, it is considered to be the closest thing we have to an encyclopedia of medieval saint lore. And so it's invaluable to art historians and medievalists who seek to identify saints depicted in art, to identify their stories, their deeds. And in fact, the story of St. George and the Dragon, for example, which you may know, is from the same golden legend, comes from the same source as the marriage of the Virgin. Now here in the painting by Raphael, we see the story of how Saint Joseph came to be betrothed to the Virgin. Now even if the title of the work focuses on the Virgin, we must remember that in fact this piece was meant to be an homage to the groom in this wedding, to Saint Joseph in fact, because the Albizzini family chapel in Città di Castello was dedicated to Saint Joseph. Now, according to the legend, Mary had been brought up and educated in a very chaste way in the temple of Jerusalem. And when she reached the age of matrimony, each of her suitors was given a dry rod or branch and told to wait for a divine sign from the heavens. So Mary's hand was to be granted only to the man whose branch, whose rod would bloom. And of course, the only budding, flowering rod turned out to be St. Joseph's. And so Raphael shows him here with the flowering rod in one hand. Let me see if I can enlarge this for you a little bit. Here you go. And the ring on the other. And then we have the high priest in the middle with his head gently tipped like a Byzantine Madonna. He's almost in empathic mood, in fact. And he is now going to solemnly join the couple in accordance with these divine wishes. Now, of course, 
this story had been told, had been narrated and put into images many times before. And Giotto had told the very same story. So he had depicted the story, as you can see here on the right hand side, in the Scrovegni Chapel, the very famous Scrovegni Chapel, which is also known as the Arena Chapel in Padua as part of that wonderful series of frescoes. And the year is 1305, so basically 200 years before the Raphael was painted. 1305 is the date which, uh, for many art historians, signals the birth of humanist thinking. Now, if you notice, in the interpretation by Giotto, the dove of the Holy Spirit descends between Saint Joseph and the, the priest on the left-hand side. And you'll notice also the, that Mary in the Giotto interpretation holds her hand to her womb, so alluding to the incarnation of Christ. Now, on the other hand, Raphael's version is a little more humorous. So you can see that the rejected suitors stand on the right, and one is particularly discouraged. I'm going to enlarge that for you now. He's standing right next to St. Joseph, and he takes out his disappointment on the branch, which was far too short and far too barren for him to be chosen. So the scene naturally becomes a little more vivid and a little more earthly in late 15th century Italy. And this is normal, considering the central role which man will come to play in these illusionistic paintings. Now, Giotto's figures are solid, monumental, influenced by the sculptural tradition. The faces are full of gravity, seriousness. On the other hand, Raphael is naturally interpreting the scene through the daintiness and elegance of a 15th century central Italian court. So if you look at the figures in the Raphael, I don't know about you, but when I look at these figures, I always feel like they are swaying gracefully to the sound of a melody that only they seem to be able to hear. And if you look at St. Joseph and some of the men and also some of the women, they appear to be striking these very delicate ballet poses. Their limbs are so classically and musically positioned. And this is probably not a coincidence at all, but is directly connected to the importance of dance in 15th century. And in fact, at this time, we begin to see the emergence of dance masters. And one of the most important dance masters of the time was a man called Guglielmo Ebreo da Pesero. And he completed his career in Urbino, nonetheless. And he also famously wrote a treatise on dance, which was very influential. And being a good dancer was very important for the ladies and the gentlemen of the Italian noble courts. It gave rhythm and poise to their social standing. And dance is itself influenced by humanism and especially influenced by the Neoplatonic theories of humanism was thought to mirror the order and harmony of the universe. And even according to the German art historian Abby Warburg, who at the end of the 19th century was the first to introduce the iconographical method before Panofsky actually established it, the performing arts in 15th century Italy represented a bridge between art and life. So through the Renaissance style, painters like Raphael began to represent life in movement and so performances such as dance, theater, court sonography, musical interludes, these must have provided contemporary painters with a certain amount of inspiration. Now, Raphael's Marriage of the Virgin is often compared to this next piece on the right-hand side of your screen, and this is Perugino's Giving of the Keys 
to St. Peter. And it's a fresco which was executed by this Umbrian master, Perugino, for the lower walls of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. So this was, in fact, Perugino's claim to fame. And it was part of a series of frescoes which was commissioned at the end of the 15th century, in the 1480s to be exact, by Pope Sixtus IV. And it involved many of the most sought after artists of the Quattrocento, including Perugino. But of course, this was 30 years, more or less, before Michelangelo was to paint the glorious ceiling. So when we visit the Sistine Chapel today, our eyes go immediately towards the ceiling, and this is natural. But in fact, that whole chapel and even, even the middle ground of the walls and the lower grounds of the walls exemplify, express the best painting of the Quattrocento. Now, at first glance, if you, if you compare the two, the two pieces on your screen now, you can see that the compositions are alike in many ways. So we have the same kind of array of foreground figures, divided, separated by the architecture in the back by this intervening piazza. You'll also notice in the Perugino these wonderful greenish, bluish hills that can be spotted, in fact, in many of Perugino's altarpieces throughout the, the wonderful region of Umbria. So in places like Città della Pieve, Spello, uh, Perugia, and many others. And in fact, what we should really be comparing Raphael's Marriage of the Virgin to is another painting by Perugino, which is on the right-hand side now. And this is Perugino's altarpiece for the Duomo of Perugia. And you can see it's exactly the same story. And the two paintings were completed uh, just a few, just a, a year, less than a year from each other. Perugino completed his version for the Duomo of Perugia just a few months before Raphael began his. So we can hypothesize it, it's probable, although we do not have any historical proof, that perhaps the Albizzini family in Città di Castello had seen the masterpiece by Perugino, the prototype, in the, the Duomo of Perugia, the two cities are only about 50 kilometers apart, and perhaps had asked Raphael to create a close replica. Now, the two paintings had never, ever been exhibited together, had never shared the same physical shape until 2016 in Brera, when the piece by Perugino came to visit and a dialogue was established. Now, again, we can see if we compare the two pieces that the types of figures that Raphael paints at this early age do have um, this sort of symbiosis with some of the features of Perugino's figures, right? So we have these elongated forms, the oval heads, the swaying motions. But if we look again, if we look closely at the Raphael, we realize that at this point, he surpassed his master in draftsmanship, in composition, in perspective. By comparison, Perugino's spatial disposition looks a little flat. The figures look frieze-like, whereas Raphael's men and women have this gentle curve. They are disposed within the space with a kind of gentle semicircle. And they are well inserted within this depth, which really does appear to be there. Raphael makes this scene much more three-dimensional. There's no doubt about it. Now, this may have come from looking at Piero della Francesca's wonderful and perfect mathematical compositions when he was a boy in Urbino. Or it may just be that Raphael needed to break free from the standard and allow his figures to breathe. At the same time, Raphael's figures, compared to the ones by Perugino, and you will tell me afterwards if you agree, have a more noble demeanor. They are more composed, as it were. It seems as though he has this uncanny way, 
Raphael, a fusing artifice with nature, which will set him apart from the rest. You can also see in the Raphael that there is a deeper perspective of squares, that much more room is given to those squares in the stone flooring, and that it guides our eyes freely towards the back of the painting there. And we join, we walk up those steps and we join those dainty little figures on the steps and around the temple. And we can see that the temple and its roundness is fully perceived, allowing us to imagine that in fact we are an integral part of this sunny and poetic realism. Now the vanishing point of the lucid perspective that Raphael employs leads our eyes directly, and I hope you can see this here, within the soft darkness between those two openings, within that door, the open door of the temple. And it is precisely this darkness which gives us the distinct impression of real space. And then from that second door towards the rear of the temple, we can once more travel through space, through the painting itself, through the remote horizon, through the, the gentle curve of the hills, and feel the air of the surrounding Umbrian countryside. Now feast your eyes, if you can, on the beautiful volutes of the temple. I'm going to focus on those now. And you can see that they seem to have a kind of metallic quality to them. It's almost as if they were created by a goldsmith, not by a painter. But they are in fact painted, and they are painted precisely and directly on the surface of the panel with no underdrawing, no preparatory drawing whatsoever, whatsoever. And in fact, this really allows us to understand that Raphael had a very firm hand and a very, very skillful technique. The temple painted by Raphael, some critics uh, feel, is so exact that the existence of a wooden mo model is suggested. Now, undoubtedly, the temple that, Brahma that Raphael is painting here on the left-hand side was probably affected or influenced by the ideas, in fact, of the architect Bramante, Donato Bramante, who also came from Urbino. He was Raphael's townsman. And Bramante is going to be the future architect of St. Peter's. And before Raphael works on the piece of the marriage of the Virgin, Bramante had already begun to create, to build this wonderful little circular temple that you can see on the right-hand side now. And this is the Tempietto of San Pietro in Montorio. And it was commissioned by the Spanish royals, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. It was begun in 1502, to be precise, and it was established to mark the spot where St. Peter was thought to be crucified in Rome, on the Janiculum Hill. So it's a circular temple, as you can see, uh, with, set, with steps leading up to the main cella, just as Raphael had painted. And it also has a hypnotic walkway of 16 columns going all around. And within it, a very small cella, or enclosed interior sanctuary, just, just like the one in fact, or similar to the one painted by Raphael. Now the two temples are not identical, this is clear, but there are enough similar features to make us wonder if Raphael had somehow seen Bramante's sketches, Bramante's designs, uh, or if he had been able to make a fleeting trip to Rome during the construction of the piece. Now, Bramante is much older, of course, at this time. Bramante is 56 years of age. 
Rafael is 19, early 20, and just at the beginning of his career. So it's very, very plausible, in fact, that Bramante was Rafael's mentor. And so that this, in some way, is meant to be an homage to his mentor. Now, the ultimate inspiration for Bramante's Templito is undoubtedly a circular temple, an antique circular temple that you now see on the left-hand side, dedicated to the goddess Vesta in the grounds of Hadrian's Villa in Tivoli, a wonderful archaeological site, by the way, Hadrian's Villa, just outside of Rome. Now, other precedents, other examples for Bramante could have been the Byzantine Martyrium, the early Christian Martyrium, even Leonardo's sketches on radial architecture. And certainly another seed which probably planted itself in the consciousness of Bramante was the circular temple, the ideal temple designed by Luciano Laurana and probably painted by Pier della Francesca in this very famous piece that you, say, that you see here at the bottom, which is the ideal city. The ideal city, which of course is a philosophical humanist construct that had been discussed, that had been written about by Alberti. And there are in fact three panels relating to the concept of the ideal city. Now, according to the art historian Frederick Hart, for example, for Bramante, the planning of the Tempietto must have represented the union of illusionistic painting and architecture, which he had spent his entire life perfecting. The building, as you can see, is situated within the middle of this convent's courtyard. You have to imagine that in Bramante's original plans, original designs, the courtyard was meant to be circular also. And so, of course, the Tempietto would be the perfect symbolic centerpiece. And in fact, the, the, the functional aspects of this architecture play a very minor role for the cella on the interior is way too small to accommodate a congregation. It's only 4.5 meters in diameter. So according to this hypothesis, it was conceived as a picture in stone to be looked at, to be gazed at from the outside as a marker. And this comparison with the painterly dimension um, interests me very much because we can now look at Raphael's temple as his rebuttal to Bramante. Now, ultimately, Raphael was interested in the very same problem that interested Bramante and many others, which is the central plan church. And we must remember that geometric forms in the Renaissance, especially in the high Renaissance, were invested spiritually and that the divine circle, that the circle was a divine vehicle uh, through which one could imagine the perfection of paradise, the perfection of heaven. And so Raphael's version of the temple is no longer a symbolic marker, is no longer a symbolic backdrop as it was in the Perugino, but it reflects the new humanist civilization. Humanity interacts with it, as you can see. It represents our creative potential. And it also represents that prehistoric desire that we've always had to feel closer to God in some way, to the spiritual dimension, to connect in stone and poetry to the spiritual realm. If you think about it, ever since prehistoric times, architecture, even the most simplified form of architecture, has also been a way to extend an arm towards the heavens. And whatever the reason, the beautiful, airy structure and elegant structure that Raphael painted became iconic and it influenced generations of painters, generations of artists, all the way down to the surrealist Dali. And you're seeing a piece by Dali in the background, this wonderful triptych. 
And uh, Dali, as you can see, chooses to echo the forms, even though they're stylized in a Spanish way, but he echoes the forms of that centrally planned church, and especially that tiny open door in the distance. It's the same tiny open door that you can see in this very hauntingly eerie rendition of a desert landscape by Dali. Now you may not uh, expect me to do this, but the next work which I'd like to talk about, which belongs also to the Brera collection, is a painting on the left hand side now from 1915. So we jump in time from Raphael's Renaissance youth to Modigliani's strife, to his early 20th century angst, as it were. Now Modigliani's love of Quattrocento art was well known. So the very same culture that Raphael had come from was beloved by Modigliani in the 20th century. And it manifested itself when he was still very young, when he was just an adolescent. He was 14 years of age, as the story goes, and apparently he had, he was often bedridden. He was a very uh, sensitive, child and an adolescent and he suffered when he was 14 he suffered from a, a, a violent typhoid fever which almost killed him and during his fever induced visions he saw himself missing the train to florence just constantly missing this train every night he would have the same dream and he wanted to catch this train to go to the uffizi to go to florence and visit the uffizi but he would always miss it Miraculously, he's going to survive, of course, his, he's going to recover his health. And as a prize, he will spend his convalescence undertaking this wonderful grand tour with his mother, accompanied by his mother, uh, a grand tour of museums, galleries, archaeological sites all across central Italy. And so art for Modigliani is going to be seen as a form of salvation. This is very, very important to, to remember. Now, the, the, average, the average traveler or visitor to, to Brera will be drawn to this institution because of the old master paintings that it treasures, but there is also a wonderful array of 20th century paintings to choose from, which I highly recommend. Now, granted, up until a few years ago, you, they were usually exhibited in out-of-the-way corners of the exhibitions and at present, as you can see on the right-hand side, one must peer at them through this kind of metallic and glass screen of a, of a cage-like structure like this one, which has been temporarily installed in uh, some of the central halls of the Pinacoteca di Brera. Now I say temporarily because the plan, the project, is to house the entire modern collection in this beautiful building that you now see on the screen, which is an 18th century noble palace called Palazzo Citerio. And it's just down the road from the old Pinacoteca di Brera. Now, it was acquired by the state already in the 1970s um, as an extra exhibition space for Brera in mind, and indeed the project is, is now called Brera Modern. Now, the restoration of the building was um, undertaken by uh, Italo Rota, and it's only just been completed. Hopefully, this crisis, this COVID-related crisis, and the consequent shortage of, of funds for enterprises such as this will not impact upon this dream too much. Um, one thing I'd like you to notice, it's really very wonderful and it's a feature of many of these uh, 18th century noble palaces in Milan, is the mosaic ceiling, uh, the mosaic floor that you see here, this geometric motif of black and white pebbles. Now, this is a precise technique, uh, uh, and it's called allarizzata. And these cobblestones, these gray and white cobblestones, come from the bottom of the Lombard rivers. 
So it's a very, very traditional technique, and you can see it in many of the private courtyards of these noble palaces. Now, to get back to Modigliani, Modigliani is, the, is probably the most mythologized modern artist since Van Gogh. His nickname back then was Modi, uh, which in French means the damned. And much has been written about Modigliani, about his rocambolesque romantic love affairs, and certainly he was identified as the king of Bohemians, perhaps even more than is necessary, if I may add. Now, during his lifetime, he really was cursed in a way by the fact that his art could not be catalogued in any of the main artistic schools. Sometimes it was deemed not modern enough by some of the avant-garde, and other times it was criticized for not being academic enough, so he could never win, really. But it was elegant, mysterious, haunting, difficult to place at the time, and yet we clearly see its timelessness today. Even as I glance at this portrait on the left-hand side here, um, the first thing I am reminded of is a Byzantine icon with its frontality, its stylization, and with this incredible presence that it has. At the same time, it is impossible for me to look at a portrait by Modigliani without being reminded of African masks, Cambodian sculptures, like the Khmer sculptures that you see on the bottom right hand side there, or even to think of some of the purity of a cycladic statuette, like the one that you also see there on the right hand side. You can see the, the, the sort of the similarities. If you look at the simplifications, the ovals, the cylindrical necks, it's all there in Modigliani, in this beautiful and haunting package. Now, during the years, the early years, between 1910 and 1912, when uh, Modigliani was a, a starving artist in, in Paris, he will be very, very attracted by the beauty of the Indian sculptures that he can see at the Musée Guimet, for example. He'll also be very attracted by the African artifacts that he can see at the Trocadero and in the many uh, antique stores which had surfaced in Paris since colonial times. Uh, in fact, at this time, salvation for Modigliani will often come from the so-called primitive art, which was all the rage back then. And the Trocadero was the ethnographic museum, which had opened recently, and students and artists would flock to the Trocadero uh, to discover these new, well, relatively new, in fact, uh, pre-industrial cultures from the past, which appear to be so unrelated to the evolution of Western art. And the discovery of these wonderful works of art from the Ethnographic Museum will suggest new canons of beauty to many avant-garde artists. There will be new ways of thinking about form and about the symbolism. Now you'll, you'll also notice that the portrait that I chose on the left-hand side there seems to have a kind of reddish complexion. And this could be, we can hypothesize this, that it can come from the Khmer sculptures uh, that also used a reddish kind of sand, sandstone, sandstone, which is typical of the Cambodian architecture and sculpture. Now, Modigliani already came from a very cultured uh, family in Livorno, so he had a very rich and imaginative and cultural background. To begin with, he had been taught philosophy by his grandfather, French by his mother, and by the time he was dreaming of Florence, he could quote Dante, he could quote D'Annunzio, Baudelaire even by heart, quoted freely from Nietzsche. And also, which, which I find very interesting, during his adolescence, he developed a passion, a fascination for the occult and for the spirit world, which is something that I think we must keep in the back of our minds. Now, there are two other portraits 
in the Brera collection by Modigliani, and you can see the trio now of Modigliani portraits in Brera on your left-hand side there. And we can see that whether he was starting from the features of his good friend, Moise Kiesling, who was a Polish artist uh, living in Paris, or whether he was looking at the features of his lover, Beatrice Hastings, probably the, the character on the left-hand side that, there, he would try to uncover the essence of humanity, uh, which links them all together. So the direct gaze of his sitters is very, very important. And in all of the portraits, no matter, no matter how shorthanded or stylized they may seem, we can always tell that yes, he was sensitive to the individual personalities of the sitter, but at the same time, he wanted to find a common denominator. He wanted to find the essence of humanity. Now there is this direct gaze, which in my mind tells us that Amedeo Modigliani felt very strongly about the sacredness of the human face, which was nature's supreme creation in his mind. Now, unlike the Cubists, which were developing and had already developed their avant-garde a few years before, the Cubists wanted to break up life in a visual image. They wanted to break up and reassemble life on a flat surface. Modigliani, on the other hand, as you can see, wants to preserve the integrity of the face or preserve the aura of that face, perhaps we should say. Now, Cubism, and in this case, Picasso, because we're looking at a, a painting from Picasso on the, on the right-hand side there, just as a comparison, but Cubism employs an almost surgical method of dissecting the image in life in order to find all of its facets and to possess all of its knowledge at the same time, all at once, presenting all of its formal and conceptual secrets. And in fact, perhaps Modigliani wanted to maintain, on the other hand, some of this secretness, some of this mystery. Um, he was not interested or not as interested as other avant-garde painters in the formal artistic debate. Now, the other thing that I'd like to point out in these, in these portraits by Modigliani is the use of lettering. You can see that in many of his portraits, he will de develop the habit of inserting inscriptions at the back there of the, of the heads of the sitters. Now, mostly they are names, names of the sitters. And to compare it to Cubism, again, in synthetic Cubism, in the collage that Picasso and Braque will, will, will develop, there is this inclusion of the written word as well in newspaper clippings uh, or other sources, sources which are seen in the collage as a way to fuse art with the painterly dimension. But Inscriptions were also very, very common in ancient art, and it is more likely that Modi was interested in referring in a very melancholy way to the antique world, and perhaps he was referring to Byzantine icons. And you can see that in this Byzantine icon, when art was purely symbolic, it was absolutely logical to write on the surface of, of the work, on the background of the image. Um, and in, in some way, inscriptions reaffirm the names, the, the prayers, the stories from the Bibles, the, the quotes from the Bible, uh, painted on, on these icons. And in fact, I find that inscriptions like these are directly proportional to the presence or absence of linear perspective in painting. So when Renaissance perspective develops and the painting is seen, uh, imagined as a window onto real life, then inscriptions cease to appear. They have no reason for being. In Modigliani's time, on the other hand, when perspective is questioned again, revolutionized, and when painters want to assert the flatness of that canvas again, 
well, then we see inscriptions appearing, once again, reappearing, adorning and enriching um, the surface of this flatness. Now, another shared element between all the portraits by Modigliani seems to be the fact that there isn't much of a context in the background. And in fact, it's quite austere. There seems to be not a lot of depth at all within the painting. So his subjects do not seem to want to interact with, with the space around them. Their reason for being is probably more within themselves. Their reason for being may also be outside of that frame, in fact. So even the, the eyes, if you look at the eyes of the two women by Modigliani, you'll see that they are drawn inwards towards their inner life. There are no pupils within the sockets. They look not towards the visible world, but very firmly within. Um, now, this does not result in a loss of personality at all. In fact, on the contrary. Now, there's a very... Um, there's a very macabre quote by Picasso, which goes like this. Painters should have their eyes gorged out, much like one used to do with birds, so that they might sing better. Now, what he meant, of course, by this very vicious metaphor was that the eyes of the painter should no longer be obsessively poised on the natural world and on mimesis, but rather on the inner quality of life. And that one must be capable, if one is a painter, to look beyond reality, look beyond uh, the natural phenomenon. So one must be partly blind, in fact, in order to develop a new sensibility, a new sensitivity. Now, naturally, all this talk of the inner world was also influenced by Freud and by his full disclosure of the unconscious. Now, finally, I feel by avoiding the presence of the pupils in, in many of these pieces, including the one that I've chosen, the viewer is more drawn towards the painting itself as an icon. He is uh, not establishing an actual relationship with the sitter the way one might establish a relationship with a sitter painted by Leonardo, O Piero della Francesca. In this case, the viewer is establishing a relationship with the symbol before him or her. And the portrait really acts as a kind of mirror, uh, allowing the viewer to reflect himself. And that image then is decoded in, in many different ways, in a very personal way, or at least this is what happens to me. Modigliani has the power to really reach within the, 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 the viscera of my persona. What sort of sensations will come forth uh, from this personal meditation are very, very subjective. And in fact, there are no limits to this. Now, the truth is that Modi had absorbed a world of art and symbolism within his own gaze and through his own painful intensity, crafted something so unique um, that it appears mysterious and new each time. He captured the life of the soul more than any other painter of his generation. This is my personal opinion. Now, another very soulful man in the history of Italian art was Jacopo Robusti, known as Tintoretto. And this is the next piece, the third piece, which I'd like to talk to you about. Now here, there's no stillness. There is no quiet intimacy, rather there is drama, action, dynamism, vigorous movements of the brush, expressing tumultuous religious scenes. And of course, the epoch is completely different. With, um, with Tintoretto, we are back in the 16th century, in the middle of the 16th century, to be precise. To the Republic of Venice is where we go, where we travel. And the Republic of Venice, of course, is where oil painting develops, where the sensuous color of Bellini, Tiziano, Giorgione, and many others made Venice the capital of tonal painting. Tintoretto, however, distinguishes himself from his peers. His style appears to be a little more modern, in fact, to our eyes. 
Now the painting that I have in mind and that I am showing you now on, on the screen is called The Search for the Body of Saint Mark. And it is quite a large panel. It's about four meters in height. So we've just come from looking at a very small painting by Modigliani, 40 centimeters. And this shift in size makes quite a different experience for the viewer. Now it's, it's difficult to, to, to perceive this on a computer screen, but you can see the, the human proportion there on the left-hand side with a gallery view of where this piece is actually exhibited. Now compared to the other supreme um, painters active in Venice in the 16th century. Tintoretto is certainly the painter who will come across the most criticism um, from his peers. He has this very strikingly rapid, seemingly spontaneous brushwork, and his compositions are, are sometimes quite loose. And this is what prompted Vasari, the uh, author of the, the Lives of the Artists, to remark that his work was done more by chance and aggressiveness and vehemence uh, rather than with judgment and design. But of course, we must remember that Vasari uh, was biased. He, he championed the drawing skills of the Florentines over the, the, the expressions of color by the Venetians. Now, in actual fact, what Tintoretto wanted to do was that he wanted to combine the draftsmanship of Michelangelo with the color of Titian. Now this may not, uh, the result is probably not as evident as he would have wanted, but still he developed a very original style. Now this that we see now is one of four paintings commissioned to Tintoretto by the Scuola Grande di San Marco, which was a confraternity of laymen, a brotherhood of sorts in fact, dedicated to char charity work. And within the Scuola Grande, of course there was a chapter house and there was this large hall used often as a hospice for the poor uh, or as a, as a hospital for the poor. And this hall was always decorated with large panels, large canvases that were meant to be didactic, they were meant to be um, spiritual, inspirational even. Now, the iconography of this piece is really quite fascinating. And according to the history, um, the historical chronicles, the body of St. Mark, the evangelist, was taken from Alexandria in Egypt in the 9th century, in 828, when two Venetian merchants traveling in Alexandria obtained, managed to obtain the relics of uh, St. Mark the evangelist, from two Christian priests who uh, had feared that the relics of the saint might be damaged or destroyed during the attacks of the Saracens upon the Christian community at the time. So they helped the Venetian merchants to carry it back to safety. And so the Venetian merchants brought back this body to Christianity from Islamic Egypt. Now you can, you can see that there is a heroic character uh, to this enterprise that would have been fully perceived in 16th century Italy. Now Tintoretto's Venice, of course, um, also represented the only free republic in Italy. Otherwise, uh, Italy was dominated by France and, and, and by Spain. And Venice was threatened by the Turkish power. So you can see why this piece is so, is so fitting and this enterprise is so heroic to uh, the average Venetian in the 16th century. So this is also why Saint Mark will become the patron saint of the powerful Venetian Republic and the cathedral Saint Mark will be built in his name. Now, Tintoretto paints this scene in which the merchants are searching for the body of uh, Saint Mark. And they're pulling out all of these, all of these bodies from, the, from, the, from these funerary monuments. It's quite a spooky scene. It's quite an eerie scene. Every takes, everything takes place in this incredible cathedral of Saint Mark in Alexandria. 
and it's nighttime. So of course, this vast space is lit by a candle held by one of the merchants. I'm just enlarging that so you can see, right? Uh, just at the back there, there's this huge rushing architectural space with these big swooping arches, um, which gives us this incredible perspective and which conveys a sense of urgency to the scene. And you can see there that there's a checkered pavement, very, very similar to the one that Raphael had also used as a trick to lead our eyes within the depth of the painting. And at the very back of the painting, what do we see? We see this rectangular opening, a burst of light, and two men opening the lid of a very large stone tomb. That's where the body of St. Mark is found. So there's this drama, uh, in fact. And of course, however, much of the theatrical um, action takes place in the foreground of this piece, where we see the dead body of St. Mark splayed down on the ground, feet first, in fact, in the same foreshortened way in which Mantegna had described the dead Christ, which is also a piece in Brera, by the way. And this could be a purposeful quotation by Tintoretto. Now, the figure in the foreground there on the left-hand side, wearing this beautiful uh, gold brocaded robe, is the patron of the Scuola Grande of St. Mark in Venice. His name was Tommaso Rangoni, and he was a doctor, an important man in pest-ridden Venice at the time. We see, we see him kneeling next to the body, and he has this sort of very protective gesture towards the body. And we realize that really he does not belong to this same time frame. He's almost like a narrator here. Let me just go back to the uh, full piece. He's a narrator from another dimension. So he's narrating from 16th century Venice what is going on in, 19th, in 9th century Alexandria, but he's living through this, participating in this. So he's really quite a, a ubiquitous character. And in fact, it's a very complicated narration, Tintoretto's. For we see the body of St. Mark, for example, three times. So in the foreground, in the background where the tomb is opened, and then in the front on the left-hand side. And in fact, this figure, this elongated figure, very noble figure, dressed in, in a blue and red robe on the left-hand side, with this very imperious gesture, um, is the ghost of St. Mark. He emerges or he appears to have emerged from his slumber and tries to put a stop to the despoiling of the tombs. It's as, if, it's as if he's saying, my body has been found, let the others rest in peace. And the hand of the saint, again, becomes the vanishing point of that perspective, as you can see. And we're, again, we are brought back towards this rushing architectural space with the, the drama, the depth, the movement. It's incredible to think that there are no preparatory drawings for this piece, no pentimenti either, right? So he, he much like Raphael, painted um, immediately without making any changes directly on the canvas. So how did Tintoretto prepare formally for a, such a complicated composition? We know that he studied his compositions by designing little wooden boxes um, which were kind of like small wooden stages, and he would construct these little um, terracotta clay figures to place within the wooden stage. And then he would hang the wooden box from the uh, top of the ceiling and light it with oil lamps to, to get this, this vivid chiaroscuro effect, which he would then translate uh, onto the canvas with his paints. Now these paintings, in fact, are incredibly uh, advanced for their use of light, um, for the use of color, for space. And as you can see, Tinsoretto's palette is, is a lot darker than the traditional colorful reddish Venetian palette. 
and he dramatically places these flashes of light uh, within the darkness in these very sort of strategic, strategic points of the painting. It's really quite theatrical and, and I wonder, and I'm not the only one to wonder this, could Caravaggio have learned a thing or two from Tintoretto? Tintoretto is certainly um, more anti-academic in the use of his brushwork than any of his colleagues were at the time. If we look closely, we'll realize that his painting is really quite loose, that the contours are not always precise, that even the modulation of the flesh is not complete, and that there is this incredible forceful matter in the painting, in the canvas, this forceful gesture that he uses. Um, I often think that if he had lived in the United States in the, 19, in the 1940s, perhaps he would have thrown his paint spontaneously onto the canvas like Jackson Pollock, <laughs> with the spirituality of a Rothko, mind you. But the most enigmatic piece in my mind of the painting is represented by these two strangely contorted figures, interlocked figures on the right hand side there, the bottom right hand side. Let me just see if I can enlarge that for you. Now, they seem to be grabbing hold of the body of a woman who tries to flee from them and almost, it almost looks as if she's sort of falling off the stage there. And in fact, this could be related to the portion of the story, the portion of the story which describes uh, a very uh, old and esoteric superstition. These men supposedly were possessed by the devil and they had been brought there by the merchants to help them in finding the correct relic, the correct body. Because it was said that St. Mark, even in death, had these magical powers, had these miraculous powers that he could in some way exercise the devil from the possessed. So these creatures were brought there as living bait. And you can see that one of them is in a state of turmoil as he seems to recognize the ghost of the evangelist. And this is certainly a part of the plot, which the poor and the sickly finding shelter in the Scuola Grande di San Marco would have been impressed with. Now the contortions of this group do not make for a very clear narrative and in fact there are elements of mannerism here so we're past the high renaissance and we're almost in the baroque um, the catholic church is going to uh, defend itself from the protestant attacks during the counter-reformation and because it needs religious painting to be clear to have a certain economy it is going to protest against the mannerist convoluted style. Yet I find that this grouping here is uh, really quite in, incredible in the way that they seem to spill out of the canvas onto another world. They seem to be spilling out from the frame, much like the characters in the sequel that I'm showing you just briefly there on the right hand side uh, seem to do. And here you can see, of course, that the merchants are now outside of the cathedral in a space which looks very, very similar to the uh, contemporary St. Mark's Square in Venice. And that, I, that they are busy lifting the body of St. Mark onto the camel that is going to then bring the merchants and the body to the ship, which will then bring them to Venice and so on. Uh, but we have all of these rushing dynamic figures in the back, rushing back into the cathedral. We have these um, creatures lying on the floor, these, these persecutors, in fact, of the, of the Venetian merchants, sort of trying to grab hold of them. It's, it's almost like a, a contemporary horror movie. It's so, so very different from the harmony of a Raphael from the calm demeanor of a Leonardo, but of course this was a completely different time. Everything bursts forth here. Uh, everyone seems to be speaking at once. There are elements of religious theater, actual stage setting, which the Jesuits as the most powerful, um, the most powerful brotherhood, religious order in the Counter-Reformation will make good use of. And, there, and again, there is this continuous 
relationship between art and life, between what goes on in religious theater and what goes on in religious painting. So this is the incredible story of how St. Mark, and by extension, the attribute of St. Mark, the lion, comes to be forever associated with Venice. And the lion is everywhere, not only in um, Venice, but in all of its old territories. It's chiseled onto um, buildings, stamped onto the tiles, stitched into flags. It serves as a constant reminder of the enduring power and nobility of Venice, just as St. Mark expressed the powers and the regality, the royalty of Christ in his Gospels. So St. Mark gives Venice a, an identity, a symbolic identity. My, my next question is, what is Milan's symbolic identity, since I am speaking to you from Milan? Is it the Duomo? Perhaps. But the Duomo took 600 years to build, so it's not, in my opinion, within the building itself. It's in the constant energy around it. The real spirit of Milan is not within a single monument, but is best expressed in its velocity, in its dynamism, and its continuous metamorphosis. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the Milanese expression, la città che sale. And you know, if you have, you know that it alludes to a fast growing urban organism. It represents this drive that the city has for improvement, the desire to climb, um, to grow. And you'll be interested to know that this expression, La Città Che Sale, comes from a painting, which you now see on your screen, by a futurist Italian artist called Umberto Boccioni. So we're back in the 20th century. And this painting is called The City Rises. It's now in the MoMA in New York, but the precious preparatory study, which you now see on your screen, is in Brera. And it's another one of those beautiful 20th century pieces that you can see in Brera and that hopefully we'll be able to see in Palazzo Citerio. Now, studies like these, um, sketches, unfinished drawings, they are always very fascinating. They're, they're very interesting because they seem to unravel a bit of the magic. They seem to let us in on the creative process. They reveal the progress of um, a particular idea. Now, both study and finished painting were um, founded, were created, were born in Milan. In 1910, so this is a time in 1910 when the city of Milan had already firmly established itself as the center of the Italian Industrial Revolution for quite some time. And the group of intellectuals and artists who will call themselves the futurists will sing the praises of this revolution. They will pay homage to the city, they will sing the power of technological and scientific progress, the power of speed, the power of the age of the machine. And the futurists, including Boccioni, denounced the glory of the past, the past glories of Italy, all that we have been talking about. The old fashioned institutions, the old mythologies, this incessant glorification of the past, they denounced it. They wanted Italy to march to a different tune, to march to a more modern tune, to live in the present. And I always refer to futurism as the second Italian, Italian Renaissance anyway, because it will be the single most influential and far-reaching artistic movement that the country has had since the Renaissance. So the tentacles of futurism will reach many, many different countries and insinuate themselves uh, all the way into the modernity of Europe and then later even in North America. It was a multifaceted um, movement based on fast-paced communication, avant-garde formats, poetry, painting, graphic art, product design, sculpture, architecture, photography, cinematography, the performing arts, 
typography, you name it. It was 360 degrees. Um, and they were focused on this energetic character of 20th century life. They were influenced by Cubism, so they were influenced a little bit by these French concepts, but they married them with this color, with this dynamism, with this positivity, with this vital energy, this way of painting, which of course is much more sensory than, um, than Cubist paint painting. Now the City Rises is perhaps the first truly uh, futurist painting representing, as you can see, a scene of construction. You can see this in the, in the study, but you can also see that, of course, in the, fin in the finished product. And so it's a scene of construction, manual labor, and then we have this huge, furious red horse with these blue wings uh, dragging the motion across the foreground, but in several different planes, as you can see. So we have these simultaneous planes uh, and an interesting parallel could be drawn, in fact, between the visual simultane simultaneity in uh, um, Boccioni and the simultaneous narrative that we saw in, um, in Tintoretto. So this is a, a red Pegasus, a mythical and divine creature. And in ancient Greece, the mythical and divine Pegasus was thought to be able to create springs of water whenever he set his hoofs to the ground, right? So water in this case represents uh, fertility, activity, uh, development, life, new life. And here the red Pegasus is a symbol of this new dynamism of modern society which fuels this energy and this growth. We have these pure, brilliant primary colors. There's nothing subtle or um, wishy-washy uh, about them. Um, it's, it's expressed in these sweeping brush strokes, which almost drags the viewer, in fact, along with these workers, and you're dragged across this tornado of energy. Now, in, in the mind of the futurists, the painters of the olden days had always placed viewers in front of subjects. Futurists desired to place the spectator within the interior of the piece. So it's as if we are sucked in to the painting itself. Animals and, hum and humans, they are all blurred by this um, incessant speed. And in the background, you can see the construction, you can see uh, the smoke chimneys, you can see construction sites. The population, in fact, was rising at this time in Milan. Um, it was moving from the countryside to the city, gravitating towards work and modernity. Now, when I look at this piece now, when I, when I think of this piece and I, I look at it now, I think of how restless Milan has always been. And I can see that Milan itself is a work of art. It's an artifact, a work of art for better or for worse. A work of art which has been crafted, which has been designed, imagined by many men and by many women together for more than 2,500 years and counting. And it's a creature, Milan, which sheds its skin continuously, which has always been, uh, well, which has often been cru crucified during its evolution, even self-destructed at times to uh, fulfill its need for rejuvenation. What I hope when I look at this piece and when I think of this creature is that when the current enchantment is broken entirely, and the creature wakes up again and rises again, it will also find peace in some way, perhaps even in Raphael's elegant and airy temple. It will strive for this balance between rationality and humanity, between nature and civilization. This is my greatest wish at this point as we enter phase two. So I'm 
Glad that you stayed with me till the end. I'd like to thank you for listening to this narration. And at this point, if you have any questions, I am all ears. So I'm going to exit from the screen sharing. And I don't know if um, there are any questions that I should look at in the chat. Let's see. Ciao, Alessandro. Thank you very much. Back. It's been a really great lecture. Thank you. Really I'm amazing. glad you enjoyed and, it. And, and, and I, I totally agree and I share with you, I mean, all the wishes for the future of Milan as a city. Yes. <laughs> but, but, uh, perfectly embodied by the energy expressed by the, future, by the, by the painting by Boccioni. And, yes, definitely. Uh, incredible <laughs> painting. So I really look forward to being able again and then to, to come to Milan and see those paintings uh, directly at Brera. Well, we will and welcome you with open arms. <laughs> I'm sure everybody shares the same, the same um, wish. So yes. I, I see everyone, everyone has been enjoying a lot. Great. Here. Uh, compliments coming on the on the webinar chat. Um, I don't see specific questions that we can uh, that we can uh, share at this point. Um, I'm just looking at the Q and A here, and um, I don't see any specific questions. Thank you for all the all the compliments. I'm glad you enjoyed it, um, and of course, it, it isn't safe yet for us to to begin traveling again, but uh, I think this is still a good way to connect. And as I was saying in the introduction, I think it's, it's still a time when we can recover many of these images and these seeds that art has planted within our memory. And we can meditate upon these paintings, even though we are far away. So I think it's still a, a worthwhile discussion. And I look forward to, to the next lectures, to the next narrations, and uh, to bringing a little bit of Milan into your homes. <laughs> Let so me just, just, just remember Friday, June 19th will be. Yes. Um, from Botticelli Crisis to Leonardo Conviction, four works from the Ambrosiana collection. So yes. Collection Ambrosiana will be with uh, you will be with us again on uh, Yes, I will. Absolutely. June I see there is one question here uh, for the Raphael painting. Could it have been that the temple did exist, but it was lost with time? Um, oh, you mean the model? Perhaps you mean the wooden model, model for the temple. Uh, well, scholars are still wondering, in fact, whether a wooden model exists. It, if it did exist, it was lost. But uh, our, our best hypothesis really is that he was looking to Bramante for inspiration. Bramante was his mentor. If you think of Bramante, um, he was also the man who is going to invite Raphael to the Vatican. Uh, he is the man who is going to uh, present, in fact, Raphael to Pope Julius II. Uh, so Raphael was definitely, uh, Bramante was definitely a, um, an important point of reference for Raphael. And so that Tempietto of San Pietro in Montorio, which, by the way, I really uh, recommend you, you, you visit when it will be possible, is definitely one of the inspirational uh, architectures, temples for, uh, for Raphael. I don't know whether I've um, answered the the question completely. Oh, hi, Rena and Karen. <laughs> Thank you so much for participating. <laughs> Friends from Toronto who are now in Vancouver. So some people are connecting from Vancouver. And I think some people were connecting as well from England, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Okay, so I think that online initiative yes. to not buy into the low cost that's great so i think that's that's it and um i look forward to to seeing you again in uh, in a few weeks time 
And, and thank you so, so much for organizing this. It's always a pleasure. And big, big thank you to Gloria as well and, and all of your team for helping me out with all of the technical uh, <laughs> facets of this, um, of this presentation. Thank so, you this for sure. Thank you to Gloria for making this experience so flawless. <laughs> yes, beautiful. It went, it went without a hitch, technically speaking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. So thank okay. you again, Selena, and thank you to all, the, to all our participants and look for, looking forward to, to seeing you again here and uh, stay strong, everyone. So basically, okay. we will do so. Yes, thank stay you. safe. <laughs> okay, Bye -bye. thank you. Bye-bye from Milan. Ciao. Ciao.